All right, welcome back everybody. Um, I wanna do a video, um, it's coming up to about a year now since I've had uh, the Fuji X-T4. And so it feels like a quite good time to give you my impressions of this camera um, after a year of using. Now it's, I don't wanna really make it like a kind of a review or like even an impressions. I actually wanna just kind of dive into sort of the little nuances, the little things about the camera and the menus, things I've really come to appreciate um, with this camera and why I'm, I've still held on to it um, for that year and I haven't decided to maybe try a different mirrorless system. So, um, that's what this that's that's what this video is for it's for somebody so keep watching if you'd like to know maybe something a little bit of menu diving here some kind of intricate details about how maybe a certain feature works in the camera that's what this video is for it's not going to be a very good review 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 or like like it's not going to be like an, another one of those videos you get out there it's like my year-long impressions of, of a camera not quite the same as that because i think those are quite kind of broad this is going to be quite kind of specific. This is like, I really like this kind of feature and this feature, and I want to talk about it a little bit more. So that's what we're going to do today. Now, as I started doing this video, I'm just looking at my notes here. I kind of realized that um, almost every single feature I liked about the camera, there was also a kind of negative about it as well. So it kind of feels like a good way to just kind of do a pro and con of this camera as I go along, rather than just spend 10 minutes talking about all the pros and then 10 minutes talking about all the cons, we're going to kind of do a sort of pro and con as we go through each sort of, sort of feature. So I don't have the camera in my hand right now. Um, so the very first um, feature that I'd like to talk about is actually the video, which is what I'm, I'm using to record this footage on. So I feel like, um, so I'm going to look at this all focus. Uh, just make sure the little squares over my face. That's better. So one of the things I quite like about this camera and, and why I bought it in the first place is to start doing a YouTube channel and to record some video. The other gear I had at the time just really wasn't up to that task. So number one, video. Um, is it the best of video compared to other, other mirrorless cameras? No, I don't think so. I think it's probably one of the poorest. Um, it's probably the most budget friendly to a point. Um, I only spent like $1,900 Aussie dollars to get my Fuji X-T4 and I think the Sony a7 III at the time was about another 800 bucks on top of that. I'm not sure which one's really better. I, I had a look at it, but I think I've only started to really just scrape the, the surface here and what the video is really capable of. I believe I can actually get some quite interesting films and looks out of the out of the um, video footage if I want. But yeah, it's, it's doing enough for what I want it to do at the moment. Um, I hope to, in 2022, explore video even more, take it out in the field and do some slow-mo stuff and other things like that eventually. But at the moment, yeah. Number one is video and it seems to get the job done for what I want to do and for the foreseeable future. Number two is, um, okay, so it is it is feature rich. I've wrote down that it's kind of like it's in depth. When I first got this camera, went through the menu, it did actually kind of blow my mind because the cameras I used previous to this were DSLRs and they weren't very video centric DSLRs. So it felt like the menu was quite simple to get your head around. It still took me like six months to kind of explore and work out what every little feature does in the menu. This camera, because it does video quite well as well, it's really, it's really rich. There's so many options. I still don't really understand what they do. And to be honest, the, ma the manual's no good. It tells you about feature, but it's, it's a brief one sentence and it doesn't really tell you if you have it on or off, what it's really doing. And when you put it on or off, you don't really know what it's doing. It's not really giving you that kind of feedback either. So it, it, it's, it, you know, the pros is it is feature rich. At the same time, that's a con, I think, because it's quite off putting somebody just wants a basic good camera to use, um, especially if you just, if you focus it stills. So it's quite daunting is what I say. And it, it's going to take a long time to really get to the bottom of it. I've been a bit lazy. I should really know the system inside out after owning it for a year, but I've um, been busy and other things. Yeah. I'm still a little bit behind the eight ball with some of the features, but um, I look forward to exploring them further. So um, let's just deal with the, the, the ergonomics just straight out of the, um, you know, we'll address that quite quickly because probably this is my biggest gripe with this camera. I actually really find it funny when people talk about, you know, fall in love with the Fujifilm ergonomics. I'm like, what, really? <laughs> like, have you actually held a proper camera before? I mean, it's just, I can't get over that how badly I feel the design of, of how it feels in your hand for the X-T4 for me. Um, I, it's, you know, build quality is, this is not in question, the build quality is excellent. It feels very high end precision. Everything is is perfect. It clicks and, and dials are, are wonderful to use. Um, I've held the XS10 in a shop and ergonomically it felt so much better in the hands, but the thing felt like a Fisher Price plastic toy. I mean, it just didn't feel like 
I'd, it would last a year. The, the X-T4 feels like it would just last a decade, honestly. If you look after it, you might be with this camera for a long, long time. But um, in terms of ergonomics, I really struggled. I come, I come from Pentax and they are known for having very good er ergonomics. Everything just fits like a glove in a hand. It's a um, pretty good camera system to use. But here, um, I tried a couple of L plates to try and resolve that, especially when you're using a heavier lens. Um, you know, it starts to just feel like it pulls out of your hand and it, it's, it's difficult. The L plates didn't really work well. In the end, I've, I've ended up settling with the, um, with a cage, a small rig cage, because I do actually use the cage features and mount stuff around it at different things uh, for different intents and purposes. So that's, I think it's the best of all the things I've tried, but certainly, I'm no fan of the ergonomics. But having said that, look, it, it it's quite compact. It's quite, you know, when you actually take out that L cage off, you get a very light camera, very compact, put the body cap on, stores away in a bag, really, really slim. So you, you, you know, coming from a DSLR and you, you, you open the Fuji out the box, you are taken back by actually how small and compact it is. So you can't have it all. You can't have a lovely ergonomic, ergonomic camera that fits to the hand really well without it being a bit bulky because of that. So, I mean, when I, I've shot a couple of, couple of um, professional jobs uh, last year with this camera and what I would see is that going forward, I'll probably pick up a second body. I'm not too sure for the entire day at like a wedding, I would use, I would dual wield the cameras all day. That gets a bit tiring to actually just have two cameras dangling on your person with a harness all day long. Um, but I might actually, you know, seriously just have one on my person with a body cap on and it's there as a backup. If something goes wrong, I can quickly bring that camera out, put a lens on it and get cracking on with it. Um, I couldn't do that with another camera. So I'm, I'm trying to, at the moment, I'm just trying to explore. I'm quite interested with the X-H2 that's coming up, um, what that's going to be like, because that will have a deeper recess grip. It's probably going to be more comfortable, but then it's not going to be as flush. So you can't have it all. Um, and that's kind of my point with the ergonomics. So although it's bad in one way, it's all kidding in the other. And when it's on a harness, it, and you're picking it up and putting it down, picking it up, or maybe a neck strap. I don't think it's a big if, issue with the ergonomics because it's okay just to hold it for a couple of seconds. But I did take it to the city one time, didn't have a neck strap, didn't have a wrist strap or anything like that, didn't have a nail plate on, didn't have anything, um, you know, holding it. And my fingers were getting fatigued, just that kind of pinching and holding it because it didn't really have a good grip. So, yeah, there is that. So let's move on anyway. We've, we've done that. Um, the other thing I really liked, this is a small thing, but the, the diopter that you use to adjust the EVF, um, with my other camera, Pentax, it would quite often, it's just there and it would can be nudged and not quite easily. Um, when I put it in a bag and bring it out, sometimes I'm halfway through a session and I'm, I'm realizing, hang on a minute, everything looks a bit blurry to me through the OVF, why is that? And then you realize you've nudged your, uh, your diopter. The Fuji is really nice. It's like a wristwatch. It's something that you pull out, you adjust and click and then push it back in and it locks it. I like that. I appreciate it. It's a nice little engineering uh, thing that they've done there. Um, the other thing is, yeah, so mechanical shutter and electronic shutter. This is handled really well. Um, so the, the mechanical shutter goes up to one eight thousandth, eight thousandth of a second and the um, electronic shutter a whopping um, 32,000. Now, what I like the most about it is there's a way to set it up so you, you shoot MS and ES mode together. Now, what that means is it doesn't mean that you're taking an electronic shutter every time and a mechanical shutter, but what it means is if the settings you have your camera at require you to be at over one eight thousandth of a second to get that shot, then it will automatically toggle into ES mode for that shot. And that is something I'm finding happens a lot. I live in Australia, a bright blue sky day, um, using a lens that's uh, very fast at 1.6 or 1.4 f2 and trying to protect the highlights or something you can easily be um, into the electronic shutter mode and it's quite nice because it's just this menu that you just kind of set and forget and you never need to worry about it and it will just take that shot at one ten thousandth or eleven thousand or whatever you know and it's just going to record that so i quite appreciate that the only downside to that is i'm looking at my notes is yes, you want to get, I think, 10 frames per second in high continuous burst mode when using that mode. Um, you, if you just use mechanical, you'll get a full 15 frames per second. But if you're using this combination of the two, 10 frames. But 10 frames is plenty for what I do. So it's not really an issue. Um, yeah, so uh, just following on from the electronic shutter mode, um, it's utterly quiet. And to begin with, sometimes I was looking at my camera going, has it actually taken a shot? And I'd have to go and hit playback to have a look to see that it was actually recording shots as I was holding the shutter down and not, not doing something. So 
it's utterly quiet uh, to the point that maybe it's too quiet. I actually ended up having to put um, a little sound effect on when I was in ES mode, just a little kind of click, click, click and just to, just to, so I got some feedback that the shots were taking place. It almost kind of defeats the purpose, but I'm sure it'll come in handy, you know, uh, in future events where you are in a church, you've got to be really, really quiet and uh, you just want to be silent. So it's there it's nice it's silent and it's a good es mode so some other es modes i've had like with pentax cameras they don't really offer any benefit they don't give you more than a mechanical shutter speed and they're still noisy so um they maybe just help with shutter shock and stuff like that but no with the fuji it's fantastic um and i've said about that um yeah so this was an interesting one quick shift uh, quick shift is a term we use for in pentax anyway where you can use autofocus and then override it with manual focus and it's a feature that's only on the lens so certain lenses will have quick sh quick shift and other lenses won't with the fuji system quick shift every lens is quick shift because it's something the body does and you can tell it in the body to have that feature on or off so that's a pretty cool i mean when i say every lens maybe some third party lenses it doesn't work i'm not too sure but all fujinon lenses have quick shift natively because it's actually a feature of the camera body versus the lens so that's that's nice to have because it's something i quite like to have um anyway um next up um dynamic range recovery okay this is something i was familiar with before I bought fuji and what this basically is uh, with the pentax uh, k1 anyway um, you would have something called highlight correction. So you you are be able, it basically applies a bit of a tone curve, I think, to the raw file and is baked into the raw file as well. Um, the shadow recovery on the Pentax isn't baked into the raw file. It's only in the um, JPEG, but on the Fuji, the highlight recovery and shadow recovery is built into the raw file, which I really appreciate. <clears throat> and it's a little bit more amp amped up because it gives you two stops instead of just one stop. So um, how it works is it, it says um, dynamic range off is actually 100%. It's a way, weird way to word it, to actually have dynamic range 100% as, as being off, but that's the way it is. Um, and if you're at 200%, you've got to shoot a minimum ISO 320 and you get one stop protection each way. And if you go to 400% dynamic range recovery, you have to shoot a minimum shutter speed of 640, but you get two stops both ways. And it's really nice to actually get that dynamic range and it's built into the raw as well. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, I mean, like to say, the only con of that is you are, if you choose to use that and you don't have to, um, then you are at ISO 320 and 640, but I still find ISO 640 on the Fuji uh, X-T4 to be quite usable. It's, it's noise is not that bad at all. Okay. Big one here, film sims. I never knew about film sims when I bought the, F the Fuji system. Um, I was completely irrelevant. Um, not, I did know about them in the sense that I knew that the camera had these custom modes built into them that offered quite different looks okay so with other brands that i've shot the dslrs sometimes you know going from landscape to bright or vibrant you know it doesn't look like a lot of changing that much or natural mode to portrait mode it's like the colors have changed but they're very very subtle and slight you might like that with fuji it's quite in your face when you're going from classic crime to pro neg to you know eterna these are a very drastic difference in shifts in how the image looks and i knew that and i liked what i saw um so but I, what i didn't realize is that there's this whole other aspect to fuji which is called the films and recipes where it's got a high level of customization within the menu to change the tone curve even more so in in conjunction with that dynamic range recovery that i just talked about you then get a sh shadow and a highlight slider to tweak as well and you get things like clarity grain chrome effect the list goes on and on all these other things that you can turn on and off to give you something that looks like a film simulation um, it's almost like pre-processing your image before you've taken the shot and it is really actually quite handy i wasn't sure about it to begin with but i can see it's more than just gimmicky um I've done some professional jobs now where I've just used those JPEGs and maybe lightly touched them up in Lightroom and just an excellent way to do a quick turnaround of, of results and not waste your time with a raw file thinking, how am I going to interpret this? You know, so on and so forth. It's actually really quite pleasing to be on the job at the time, take the shot, look at the back of the camera screen, see your rendering and whether you like that look and you can change it to another one or whether you, you find it's good, it just needs tweaked slightly. And you just get that instant feedback. It's almost like, I mean, who wouldn't like to be, you know, out in the field shooting and seeing something like what they've spent, you know, 10 minutes in Lightroom on their image reflected on the camera at the time of the scene. I think actually it's practically useful. It can help you dialing your settings even better for the image. So 
it's useful and i, th I think um sort of financially it can make a lot of um sense if you want to do things like weddings you might the less time you spend in post processing um means that it's, yeah it becomes a more lucrative sort of pastime so of spending three weeks on raw files you might only spend like three days or two days on jpeg so definitely i think there's there's merit and benefits here that are what well, the only thing i i think i need to work out for myself is what options <clears throat> are harming the jpeg file and are really only good for viewing on a small scale and versus which ones are actually just you know okay and doesn't really matter if you're you know viewing small because for example i find the grain that it produces looks okay when the, the image is quite small like on the web or something like that but as soon as you view that image quite large don't think the grain looks very good i've seen more authentic grain that you could use through lightroom for example and other third-party plugins and things like that so that's where i'm at at the moment with film sim is just deciding maybe it's yeah, i quite like this color palette um, in conjunction with the white balance choices that the film sim is offering but i'm going to leave these other things off because i think i could do them better in post processing all right okay um i think that's all I have to say about Filmson. Okay, next feature, face detection. Okay, I had a, just as I was reviewing my video, I had the thought, the idea that I should check because I've gone through a few different firmware iterations since I bought my Fuji and I just want to double check to see if I've been talking nonsense and I think I have a little bit. I think there's been an, an improvement here um, and I'll also include some information that I forgot before. So yeah, let's just, this is all about face detection, select and everything else. So how it works is you have a face select, select off, select on. Now I don't know if you can notice there's an, actually an, an exposure shift and bump between the two modes. And that's one thing I don't like. It actually treats um, face select as a kind of photometry uh, mode like a matrix circular spot. You can see down bottom left near the, under the AFC next to the A, I'm at center weighted when I'm normal. Once I select face select on, it changes and it's in face selection mode. So there's a, an exposure shift just to use that mode. And I don't know why, I find it a little bit annoying, but there it is. Now in face select mode, I'm just going to go to the Q member. Yeah, that's fine. Q member, by the way, this little shortcut here, that is, um, you can access this and load up multiple things here, as many as you like. You can get more grid squares than just this uh, three by four. Anyway, um, that's just a one push button, like a shortcut. Um, when you face select on, it's a bit dumb. It won't do eye detection, all right? So when you're in, you just get a face, a box over the face like this, okay? But what it does do is it allows you with a joystick to move to a different person's face. And I think to begin with, that's what the main perks of using face select was. There was nothing else to be gained really other than this idea of using a joystick to push it around. So if I want to go to the bottom right, I push right to the joystick and you know, such and such. Um, the face and eye detection mode seem to be um, more restrictive and it wouldn't allow you to do this this thing where you bump around you know the, the image and select different people's faces okay so but it looks like they've improved it if I go press my Q menu and I go up here and now I switch on so you can choose right eye left eye or just like any eye at once we, we, we can see now the eye box come up but we all cause we can also see that it's got, got a box on the other person's face so i can push it over to somebody else as well so that's fantastic um it didn't used to do that i, I one of my gripes was why don't they just roll it all into one you know so you can just shift it across it'd be even better if you could just make it so that when you when you do one tap it will go from one eye to the next eye. And it doesn't do that um but it will take you to another face if it sees it by the way, the old focus might be a bit weird in this one. This is the Zeiss lens I'm using right now. Um, but yeah, so I thought that was, that was quite good um, and, wor and worthy to know. I don't know, it's still a bit buggy because when I push my button to put face select off now, but you see how it's still working? That's because we're in eye detection mode, <laughs> which is not the same as face select. So you can almost have face select on with eye detection. I don't know. It's a little bit buggy, um, Fuji, how, how they've handled this aspect. They maybe need to clean it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, it kind of works. It works, works pretty well. And just over here, um, I had another another um, shot just to show you, illustrate that. It does do quite well with finding people on a portrait profile as well. 
Um, and you can see that it's um, no problems coming up and seeing that these people are faces, even this beady man. Um, so it's having no problems there at all. Um, yeah, so that's it's quite good. What happens as well is if you get um, you know, an eye and you take the shot, um, I've got my little preview on there for like one and a half seconds. I don't know if you saw that. What I don't like is the instant preview won't let you double tap or zoom in to check focus confirmation. It literally, all you can do is that. Okay, you have to press the play button to get into the playback. I don't think that's recording anymore, is it? Yeah, I think it is. And you, yeah, I can't do this with um, with the screen, but normally I would just double tap and it would it would zoom into the eye. Um, it's just because the way I'm recording, it won't it won't let me do that. Um, but yeah, you double tap to to confirm focus on, on the eye there. All right. Um, so yeah, I think that wraps it up. Really, it's it's improved from from what it was. Um, which I'm happy to hear, but um, yeah, well, my initial review was I just thought face select um, allowed you to bump it around and eye detection doesn't. So now that it does, I think I'll probably use eye detection more. So you press the Q button and you can just quickly change which eye I'd like it to focus on or turn, turn it off. Yeah, you can you can actually see top right, there's my um, there's spot center weighted matrix, um, but as soon as you turn on face detection, you've lost that and it is a bit annoying when you're doing sort of um if you're trying to get you know the exposure right for the ambient for flash work and then you use some face detection well you know it kind of overrides it you can see that exposure shift i don't know what it's doing it's maybe just trying to protect the people's faces a little bit more or something from being blown yeah so i'm quite overexposed right now i press face select on and it's brought that exposure down do you see that maybe people like it because it helps them a little bit more all right that wraps up that segment thank you Getting on a little bit, so I'll try and pick it up the pace. Um, the other thing is, yeah, this is a bit of a, a downer for me, um, is the EV compensation dial on the back of the camera. It's really stiff. For me, I feel as though there are like three three things that really control the artistic direction of an, of an image. That is the aperture, you know, what you choose to be, you know, isolated in the scene to be the, the focus of the shot or whether everything in the scene is important. So aperture, you're obviously your composition, the angle you're taking a shot, and all obviously the light that you're letting into the lens. So EV compensation dial is pretty important. So aperture and EV comp are things that I like to adjust on the fly, and I'll show you that in a, in a little, some B-roll in a minute. But um, yeah, the, the EV compensation is just so so stiff that it really requires two fingers to change it. You know, you feel like you have to pull the camera away from yourself, use two fingers to adjust and come back. And I'll, I would just prefer it to be a lot looser. Maybe it's a good thing because then you don't accidentally nudge it and knock it. But it is a very different stiffness to every other dial um, on the camera. So I'm not quite sure why that is, but um, I would prefer it a lot less stiff. It'd be great if you could somehow control the stiffness of dials in, in cameras in general would be great. Um, but you know, this is a dial for me is just not used at all. It's just sitting redundant and that's a shame. So I've had to, uh, bind my rear dial to be EV, um, compensation and for the aperture i control the aperture on the ring of the lens itself and that has actually worked really well for me i can half press the shutter and then i can adjust the ev bias with my thumb and i can rotate the aperture ring and just get a preview of the depth all before i've taken the shot uh, that is a i can't tell you how wonderful that is to be able to do that kind of stuff on the fly it really negates that kind of i need to chimp to check that everything looks okay you don't even need the live histogram so much anymore to see what's going on you just get that instant feedback um it is something that requires two hands to do so you got one hand on the focus ring or the aperture ring and the other hand on the camera for the, for the shutter and the EV compensation. But to be able to do the both is, is pretty good. I'm not sure how it'll work if I start doing running and gunning, holding the flash of one hand, a camera the other. If I want to change the aperture, how do I do that? I need two hands to do that. So pros and cons to these sorts of things. But um, I certainly have enjoyed it for natural light shooting anyway. It's been a really good, good workflow. Um, the flip screen, it's pissed a lot of people off, eh, on the X-T4. I've actually, um, I've got the K1 and it's got a really unusual, unique type of uh, flip screen that everybody seems to rant and rave about, but it's actually not as uh, accommodating as this uh, X-T4. I think this type of screen, this, the, this one that kind of comes out for selfie for videos, it's actually the most versatile of all kind of 
camera screens. People like the X-T3 more because it'll flip down quicker, but the problem with that is it won't flip out to the side like this one. I actually quite like it. I like the fact that this screen flips in on itself so it protects the screen in the back. Um, I quite often shoot like that. When I chimp an image, I quite often chimp through the EVF, and that is really nice because it kind of blocks everything out. It's not like you're looking at the image washed out with sun. You get a much better idea. It's like looking at your image when you get home on a computer screen in a more ambient room, and you can, you can gauge better if you need to go brighter with the exposure or darker. That's just another thing I really love about the EVF. Um, it's, I think don't, not enough people talk about that actually as being a, a real benefit. The EVF is a great way of chimping um, your image. But um, yeah, when the screen is, is tucked away and I wanna do a portrait shot low down, um, it actually flips out the quickest way on the X-T4 for that type of shot. So <laughs> I don't know if you just have to adjust your workflow or how you appreciate tilt screen. So the only con I think is just how, you know, if you are going up overhead or something, you might have to take it out and then flip it. And you know, it maybe feels a bit awkward to do it that way versus just tilt down. But um, I don't know, I don't have a problem with it. I think it works fine. Um, what are we up? 22 minutes. Okay. Moving on. Um, yeah, this dot RAF files. Okay. So, um, the X trans sensor is different from, um, Bayer and all that kind of stuff. That's fine. I didn't actually realize that Lightroom doesn't play ball very well with X trans file or dot RAF files. And some files can look a bit muddy. Um, I've actually bought for $40 a program called Iridian which converts your .rav files to DNG and it's customizable to how much you, you convert and, and change it. But it actually does seem to preliminarily, it looks like it's doing a good job and the image quality is quite a lot better from using this program than using the RAV files in Lightroom. Had I known that, I don't know if it would have been a deal breaker. Um, I tried Capture One, I'm just so heavily um, invested now with the, the Adobe, with all the plugins and programs that have, you know, third party stuff that I bought, it's hard for me to really go across to something like Capture One. I'm going to lose a lot of value there. And the subscription model, I've got, I don't really have a problem with Adobe for what they charge because I, I feel like I get my money's worth. I do spend a lot of time in PS and Lightroom at times. So, and I do use Adobe portfolio. So it's all good value. Um, but yeah, that's been a bit of a, a weird one. Um, I think more companies are supporting like DXL Photo Labs now support um, .rav files or Xtrans. So we'll see where Lightroom goes with it. Maybe it improves in time. But for now, iRadiant seems to be a workaround there. Bit annoying that that had to do that, but there you go. Next thing, high button customization. Yeah, I came from Pentax and they were in, you know, known for having high level of customization, but Fuji just feels like they knocked this one right out of the park. There's so many buttons on this camera. Um, I really like the fact that the dials, the front and, and rear dials, they're actually buttons as well. You can push them and get onto different things and, and select differently. I have my rear dial selected for AF mode. So if I want to change from, uh, you know, being a certain sort of single spot mode to like a, a zone or something like that I just push it push the rear dial in rotate it with my thumb and choose a different mode it works really well um, the same with the fr front shutter one you can change it between shutter and ISO by clicking that that's a really nice touch and there's lots of buttons all over the place that you can assign however as always sometimes you just can't assign that button to do what you want to do um, one of the things I don't like for example is I like AF on the back of the camera to be a cancel AF, and I prefer that to be something you push and hold down to cancel or autofocus. Um, and I like my auto exposure lock to be a toggle button. So when I push that button, it locks it. Um, but the way Fuji has it is you can't have one or the other. You have to basically decide that AFL and AEL either are buttons that you hold down or that you toggle. You couldn't make one toggle and one hold down. You have, you know, it's silly little things like this that kind of like a little bit annoying, but you, you get used to it. Um, so there's no PASM with this um, camera and that's good and good and bad. I think some people love these little dials and messing around with the ISO and stuff like that. I prefer PASM if I'm honest with you, especially coming from Pentax where they've got like some like five user modes because I do use back button focus in, but I don't like to use it all the time. I usually, I, I find it useful for something like wildlife. I feel like Pentax has just nailed that kind of 
versatile walk, you know, take the camera out the door type of camera. I would have, you know, I would go on a bushwalk, for example, and I see some wildlife and I could quickly pop into user mode four, which would give me um, back button focusing and things like that. And then I come up against a waterfall and now I can just flip into user mode three, which is set up to have bracketing or pixel shift and a two second timer with ibis off all these sorts of things and then you know the wife sits on the rock it's time for portrait mode i'll quickly switch to use mode number one get face detection straight away it just made it really fluid and easy for that kind of like you know experience fuji feels a little bit like how you set it up is got to be you've got to make it work for everything you want to shoot um i mean it's not a big deal if you come across a waterfall there's button you, you know you could bind to change it to a timer mode there's another dial that you can flip to bracket in but you, it feels like you're doing a few more on the fly adjustments you know um, I'm sure if you were a landscaper you could just set it up for landscape use and you'll be happy but for somebody who does a little bit of different things all the time it feels a little bit more locked down you're gonna have to real think about how you're going to interact with that camera because just to go from front shutter to back button focusing it feels like it's a menu dive change um, if you want to do that sort of stuff and so we're coming up to 26 minutes which is about my maximum recording time for video on the Fuji directly to the SD card so it feels like a good time to kind of just summarize that up um, it does have a, a menu a my menu so you can bind most of the things that you frequently use in the camera to this my menu but as with all things you can't bind everything so it's a bit it feels like give and take and that feels a little bit like the relationship I have with the Fuji it gives me so much but it also kind of takes back in, in other ways um, I definitely appreciate it for this. It's it's light compared to what I'm used to using. I can put on you know some lenses and walk out the door and just feel I've got a really light kit. I feel like I've got a camera that is good for getting those moments. The capture the moment camera, that's what this is for. I'm not even t talking about frames per second, buffer or AF accuracy. They're all just a given. That's what you just get when you use milk. You don't get back or front focusing issues anymore. Everything just seems to just work really well in that regard. Um, it feels like a good good price to pay for something premium but the milk you know mirrorless you know stuff is maybe a little bit behind other brands like sony canon nikon perhaps but you're not paying quite as much for them and as long as you've got fast lenses which they do have they've got plenty of one point f1 f1.2 f1.4 f2 plenty of um weather sealed primes the lens choice is fantastic so as long as you've got those fast primes it feels as though you've almost got that full frame viable look experience you know um so yeah um no regrets i think uh, i'll stick with fuji for a few more years um and i'll add a second body at the moment i'm just deciding which body to actually add to the system but um i won't be selling my pentax stuff i think that works really well for certain genres like landscape and slow controlled work and i actually enjoy using that kind of stuff i enjoy the the manual focus experience the slowed down deliberate um so it's definitely got a place um, i'm not jumping ship by any means i just felt as though pentax are never going to do what this fuji can do and it's time to you know just give up on af or pentax and, and video and uh, yeah fuji seemed to feel like it fitted in with my brand and style the best so anyway 29 minutes okay i think we'll wrap it up there um if you've got any questions um leave them in the comments below and um i hope you found this useful um if you're somebody who's considering fuji maybe this was helpful let me know all right thank you very much bye